Hey, it's Matt Powers again from Baker Creek talking to you live. We're talking about uh, what questions you guys have. I'm here and I'm open to talk about anything you guys want to talk about, uh, about gardens and seeds and uh, how to start, how to do it the right way. There's like, you know, a lot of different ways that we, uh, we can interact with the garden. Um, but a lot of people think that there's only like one right way, you know, and that makes this whole big problem because everyone's like, oh, you can do this and it works. Or you can do this and it works. But what happens is that we don't uh, actually get engaged with like what actually is going on. And so we go with what, what looks like it's good instead of what actually is good. So um, that often is why there's so many competing ideologies within uh, gardening and food production. Uh, if you want to go one extreme, um, the industrial agriculture, uh, it focuses primarily on uh, what's visual rather than what you are looking at under a microscope um, or nutritionally, you know. So, the, you know what I mean? And then the other swing side of it is, you know, we're looking at using a bricks meter and we're examining our, 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 the starch levels or the sugar levels in our food and we're taking microscopes and we're looking at what's in the soil. You know, there's a spectrum to these things and if we use good methodology, um, we can be sure that we will have good food um, and we will have the correct things happen. So, if you guys have any questions and hopefully someone dives in here and then I can poke at it and like look at your question um, and, and I can answer whatever questions you guys got. I'm in the middle of writing this new book which is the first high school uh, permaculture textbook ever and um, it's been a huge amount of work. It's been over a year of working 12 to 18 hours a day and I've worked with um, scientists, farmers, plant breeders, researchers. Uh, fellow teachers, um, even home gardeners and families, um, to get a broad spectrum of feedback and insight. Um, and man, there's so much out there. There's there's a lot of really exciting, exciting things happening right now in the world of gardening and and plants and seeds. So if you guys have questions, you guys know you can call us. You guys know that, right? You guys can call us. Yeah, you can call Baker Creek up. You can go to rareseeds.com. You can also uh, write us if you're more into wanting to send a message. You can write us a message and we will write back. Uh, we try to answer every comment, question, every message, every phone call. Um, so we're, we're definitely trying to do our best so that all of you guys out there uh, can get... Oh, first question. Here we go. Uh, what's the best plant to start with? I just bought a house and wanted to get started. Okay, so... I would say that um, always uh, the best thing to start with uh, is the, when we think about gardening is the soil because the plants are just uh, something that grows out of the soil. So when we think about building soil with plants, the first thing that I always think of is legumes. So beans and peas, the legume family. And right now it's fava beans. Right, it's winter gardening, so we're thinking like Austrian peas and winter, you know, uh, snow peas and fava beans and things that can handle the winter, you know. So that's what I would immediately think of. And if you're thinking about your spring, um, I would think early spring because I would want to get my legumes in there first before I start establishing my other garden crops. So I would be, um, I would be growing uh, peas and beans, but then I would also be mixing in brassicas early on, uh, just because that hunger gap, you know, you can always fit kale, mustard, um, radishes and turnips and stuff like that. Okay, all right, so here we go. Let's go to the next one. And uh, favas grow in a hard frost. Well, we have to understand first that Anything that's sprouting, if it's a hard frost, it's gonna uh, not be able to handle it. Um, but if it's already grown, what happens in a frost is that, and this also depends on where you are and the moisture content of your air. So if we're in California where I used to garden, a frost would come in and if you have like a thick, a thick patch of like beans, it'll come in and it will travel some of the way down. It won't get all the way down and it'll start growing, it'll start going around the leaves, but it won't, you know what I mean, it doesn't penetrate all the way down and all the way in. So, and then uh, the next week or so, all, the, all those parts that got frosted will turn brown, but it'll keep going, and I've also seen fava beans be taken out down to the ground and then re-sprout. 
So it really depends. I know that uh, in our area here in Missouri that um, things get frosted real hard and they're still green after afterwards. Um, uh, and but, but we're talking about clover um, when I say that. I haven't done anything with fava beans yet. I plan on it, um, but it gets snowy here, so it's beyond hard frost. So I was going to cover it and heat up the ground with a, a, a greenhouse first. Yeah, Austrian pre peas rule. I have a, a bunch of Austrian peas I've been doing for years. All right, so here we go. I will go back to uh, earlier questions. Oh, it doesn't let me do that. Uh, do you think you will start carrying succulent, succulent items? Um, we do at the store. Uh, I know we carry uh, succulents at the stores uh, here in Baker Creek and in California at the Petaluma Seed Bank. Um, how do you keep kale from growing, uh, keep my kale growing during the winter? Should I plant new seeds in the greenhouse instead? Uh, my kale grew through the winter um, in, 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 in California. Uh, and so depending on, I would go for Siberian kale. Look at the Siberian kale and uh, always look to, uh, winter stuff, look to Siberia and Russian crops that really can take that, that heavy cold. Uh, can I use weeds that have gone to seed as mulch? Um, well, the problem is they're seeds, weed seeds. Um, if I miss questions, guys, please forgive me because uh, I can't scroll, so I catch it as it goes by. Um, the thing with, with weeds, you chop, off their, the, the, you chop them before they form seeds, and then you have perfect mulch because there's no weed seeds in it, and then after that season has gone through, you end up having like way less se uh, weeds that sprout, and you end up having a cleared area almost like you weeded. Okay, so, um, yeah, oh man, I wish I could scroll back. Okay, uh, feel free to re-ask one of those questions that I missed there. Uh, I can't really scroll back. Um, so, uh, going back to the question about, about uh, different kinds of kale. The thing with a lot of the brassicas is they don't taste as good unless they've actually gotten frost on them. So. When you get frost on like uh, your brassicas, um, and, this, and this is also true of some root crops, uh, when the frost comes, like with sun, uh, sunchokes, juice some artichokes, they sweeten up. Um, so the, 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 it can improve things. Um, I know with kale, um, people can grow it in summer and sometimes don't like the way it tastes because they prefer it in winter when, the, when there's frost on it because it tastes better. <laughs> so uh, I grow kale, the red, Ragged Jack, uh, the Red Russian kale. I grew that year round from like 120 degree soil temperatures to, you know, 30, 40 degree soil temperatures. So you can do a lot with it, but I also was saving the seed and letting it go to seed and set its own deal. So it was, it was, it was already doing its own thing. I, I, the more you let plants work it out themselves, the better it will go. When is the best time to plant a sprouting variety of broccoli? Well, if we're doing sprouts, aren't you doing it in, I mean, sprouts are for indoors, right? So if you're doing the sprouting variety for seed, right? If you're doing that for seed to grow seed to make sprouts from, because sprouting variety would be for sprouting inside to eat the sprouts. Um, it's a biennial, zone five. I worry that I wouldn't be able to pull it through the two years to get it, um, to get it, to, get, to go to seed. Does that make sense? That's that, uh, oh, you're talking about broccoli rob. Um, yeah, is that a biennial too? I would look at the growing season and see how long it takes um, and then go backwards from your, long, your uh, last uh, date, you know what I mean, your common last date of frost and then see if it matches your, if it fits within your first planting date of your season. I'd do that with anything. If you don't know, um, if you have the room, start off at the end of your season and go backwards. Uh, and then you can actually fit multiple things in that way too, but always start at the end and go backwards. Uh, it's snowing here. Is it too late to broadcast cover a crop? Well, depends, right? Um, if you broadcast it um, in the snow, it probably would rot um, because of the moisture. 
Um, but if you had mulch on the ground and it's under the snow protecting it, it might come through in, in the spring. I mean, that's what happens to our seeds that we miss, right? It, it still grows. Um, yeah, I wouldn't cast seed into snow. <laughs> But maybe I'll try that and see if it works. But I, I just don't, I've never seen that happen in nature. So um, I wouldn't do that. I live in zone five. Every once in a while you can make a biennial like broccoli or kale and make it through the winter. Kale is not a biennial. Um, kale uh, can make it through the winter um, much easier than broccoli that I found. Uh, and it, I think it has to do with the distribution uh, of, of its structure. So, um, there's a lot of water in the broccoli. I could see the broccoli freezing. Uh, the kale spreads things out, you know what I mean? And it has all those crinkles. Um, best, uh, so, so I would say try it. I mean, almost all my discoveries that I made myself were through actually trying it. Um, th there's different things you can do. You can do low tunnels to get it to go through your system. I know people um, are in cold areas are doing wind tunnel or you know, low tunnels um, to get uh, plants through the winter, uh, especially cabbages, uh, which are brassica, just like uh, broccoli or kale. Uh, broccoli just might be too tall and skinny, you know what I mean? It just makes so much of a target in winter. Um, but yeah, worth a try. Kale would be just darn easy, kale and mustard would be easy. Uh, you could look into green wave mustard. Uh, we carry that and that, I've had that go through winter. Best fix for getting rid of stink bugs or squash bugs. Okay, so, um, oh shoot, I lost that. All right, so the person who asked you answer, I'll come back to you, I'll come back. Um, all right, so stink bugs, all bugs are indicative of um, nature saying, hey, there's too many of this in this one place, or there's not enough diversity, or this plant, plant is weak, doesn't belong here, or this plant is sick. Um, but the bugs are really indicative uh, of, of different aspects, just like weeds. Weeds uh, tell you a lot about your soil. So if I was to uh, take squash bugs head on, um, I, I, would, I would probably bring in some chickens uh, and see if they would eat them. I, I, you know, the thing is I had them one year, but then I kind of like doubled and tripled the diversity of my garden and they all went away. Um, but El Nino could be a factor. I noticed during the El Nino year that we got slugs for the first time in eight years. So on off years where you have like that 15 year cycle hiccup, you know, you're gonna get weird bugs, so if you normally don't have that bug, it could just be coming in because of the weather, um, and you might not be able to uh, really adapt to that because it's just a, a one-year thing. Hopefully that answers that question. All right, so, uh, oh shoot, I lost that other question because I was answering that. So again, feel free to ask a question over if I haven't answered it already and it's in the feed because all I've got right now is Cody. Oh, Cody, yes, you did it. Okay, clay soil, never seen this many this summer. So maybe slugs, oh, or stink bugs. Um, well, I don't know if the stink bugs would be directly related to the soil. Of course, everything's, everything is related. Uh, but uh, my area, was decomposed granite. There's definitely more organic matter and clay in the soil here. Um, yeah, so it's really the, the bugs, the weeds, um, diseases, they're all in relation to diversity. Is there a best type of bag mulch or for when I can't afford an entire delivery of the free county mulch doesn't, doesn't show up? Yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, when we go for free, sometimes we get what we pay for. And that's a really hard thing, I assume. Um, yeah, I don't buy mulch in bags. I don't buy things from stores. Um, and so I tend to create my own mulch on site. Or at this time period, people everywhere have uh, leaves falling and 
or especially you know in, in the humid uh, humid temperate climates you got a lot of leaves and everything um, coming off the trees um, and you could use a, a lot of neighbors uh, mulch at this time I'm gonna read this question real quick I have a mild coddling moth problem a young apple tree red one tip cover each apple when they are one diameter with paper bags for the rest of the growing season would that hurt the apples it wouldn't hurt the apples um, unless you're like trapping moisture, holding moisture on it, um, it wouldn't hurt the apples. I've also seen um, people mix uh, clay with water and make a spray and spray it onto their, their, their fruit trees. And that gives you a protective coating. And I think the way that works is it covers um, the plants um, from releasing smells. And um, and so that they're not detected, um, or, or it covers up the exudates on the plants. The, uh, I think the term is extra floral nectary um, points on the plant. And, but, but you might look into that using clay with water a, as a spray. There are actually a lot of options. Um, I, I've used diatomaceous earth on, on fruit trees because uh, I didn't, didn't do the clay thing. And that works really well too. It even works on the borers. Because it not only does it um, attack the bugs and, and break them up, and, and that, any bugs that are actually attacking it, it dries up those wounds. Okay, I'm asking right now on Facebook for my friend's leaves. They bag them up anyway. Oh, I'm so glad to see that, Sue. Yeah, it's amazing. There's resources everywhere that, uh, like, you know, I drive home and I see people burning leaves and it's like giving me heart attacks. <laughs> Because all that organic matter, all that carbon they're releasing into the atmosphere needs to go back into the soil. That's where the tree pulled it out of. They're pulling it out of the atmosphere and out of the soil. So <laughs> let's not continue releasing it into the atmosphere. Let's put it back in the soil so we can use that organic matter to make more nutritious foods and make our plants stronger and our environment better. Uh, okay, I brought Tulsi plants inside before freezing. That was awesome because Tulsi plants are amazing. I love, I love holy basil tea, which is Tulsi, if you, if you don't know. And we sell that seed and uh, I love, I love it. So yeah, I would totally bring that in and keep that going and take those seeds off that and plant it again next year. How, uh, squash vine borers. You know, with the vine borers, I, I, would, I would go out there and dust some, um, dust some diatomaceous earth on it. Just go for that. Um, I, I would see what that would do do to them because it gets it in there in there um, so there are, are arthropods and that means that there's there's joints in their legs and so the diatomaceous earth gets in in between uh, the joints and it starts working in there and dries them out and turns them into like bug beak jerky is how one person has described it so that that's what I would do for that and then I mean realistically all these bugs are attacking uh, the plants because the plants are weak in calling the bugs. And they wouldn't call the bugs, they'd tell the bugs to go away and they'd call other bugs in to protect them if they were doing better. So what we need to do is we need to give them a toolkit to work with. And that toolkit would be uh, soil life. And so the uh, soil food web, you could activate that by making a compost tea with a uh, compost that you made from materials on your site. And then that would be local, uh, you know, food soil web, you know, microbiology. And then you would uh, make a compost tea out of that and then you would put it on the plant like a foliar spray and then you would water it into the ground. And if you have compaction, you might even broad fork it a little bit and then water it in. Okay, I'm missing questions here. What should you do in spring for a first year disease resistance garden, squashes and tomato. I would do what I just said. I, I, I would use compost because that gives your plants the options. So they decide. Um, and then that gives you the most options and resiliency because it's based out of the soil and the soil life. For sure. Um, Keith, I used heating pad underneath all the plants I grow indoor during the cold season to keep temp. Yeah, you could use heating pads. You could create a situation where you have um, a sunny room. Um, you could double pane the glass up. You could create a cloche outside where you take glass and put it on over a plant. Um, you can create a cold frame. There's 
lots of options depending on your situation. It's getting cold in here. Get my jacket on. All right, so now that's different. All right, so um, anyone else has any questions? I'm on Kayla Ray Crabtree. That's, that's the last one I, I saw. So if anyone I missed, I saw there was like five in there that I missed. Um, so for me, in my own personal experience, just to share, I first did, I did a garden my first year and it, like everything grew. It was like amazing. And then the next year, nothing like grew up. And it was like the animals discovered me, the bugs discovered me. And all that had happened was all the soluble nutrients in the soil were eaten up. That's all that had happened. And so all I did was call in all the, the pests and the animals to take care of the garden for me because they were going to eat it and then their waste was going to go back down and start trying to feed it back in. And so I started using compost and compost tea, started doing more diversity, I started bringing the legumes in in a major way and everything started changing really, really fast. Actually with compost tea and cow peas, um, my soil started going really deep, like within um, a couple months. And it was like magic. It was like flipping a switch because this soil life went crazy and started getting darker and darker and darker. Um, and I did that uh, starting in a fall, like right now, you know, Californians. Um, and by the spring, and I, I had people coming over who are farmers, and this is like, you know, I'm a school teacher at this point, uh, coming over and like putting their arms like this deep into my soil and being like, this soil, how is this soil in the foothills? What is this? You know, where did you, where did you bring this soil in from? You know what I mean? And uh, professional generational farmers, and it's just compost and compost tea. So uh, look into that. I have some empty space, but new to gardening and don't know what it's easy to grow. Okay. So staple crops are pretty easy to grow because everyone grew them. And so they grew with us. Um, and because they became commonly grown, they're, they're easy to grow. Um, and those harder to grow plants that we grow that are more obscure, if we more people grew them, they'd become easier to grow. So. Corn, squash, uh, brassicas of all kinds. So like turnips, radishes, you know, all, all, all those sorts of things are um, very, very easy to grow. Turnips, they turn up, you know what I mean? Radishes, they, they boom, they, they, they're there in a couple of weeks. So, um, especially like small radishes, like uh, the uh, French breakfast radish that we have, that's a really good one. And that's a great one to start with because you don't wait that long. You're instantly getting it and uh, you can have it raw in the garden, fresh. Um, and that's like a thrill to eat your first uh, food out of a garden. You know what's a real thrill? Is having your first hot strawberry or hot watermelon in the garden. I hadn't thinking about that now because it's cold. <laughs> but for real, like when you have fruit that you normally have cold in a store hot, there's this like, and it's fresh, and it's like the enzymes, everything's still alive in it. It, it just tastes like, like nothing you'll, you've ever tasted in your life because you've never had it that way. You know what I mean? You've never had it fresh from the garden. You've never had it hot. You know what I mean? And like that's one of the most fun things about the garden. I have potatoes uh, I planted in my compost pile this spring. They will be okay to leave there over winter and harvest next fall when I spread my compost pile. Will they? Um, onto the garden. Okay, so the thing with compost, I mean, if it's a cold compost and it's breaking down organic matter, even if it's cold to a degree, those potatoes are threatened. Because if it's a cold compost and it's a passive compost, you have critters eating the food in it and breaking down the food for you. If it's a hot compost, it could cook them or cause them to sprout and then stun. Um, and if it's a fully composted compost, and it's actual compost, it's not gonna be hot. Um, and then it would just be like humus or, or dirt that you're keeping it in, uh, except it would have the life in it. And I think that would be okay if it, it's finished compost. Um, I think that would be okay. You'd plant it and it would be covered with all that uh, microbiological life, you know, that'd be great. Um, how do you choose the ideal spot for a garden? 
I've talked about this a few times. Uh, so you, you want to choose an area that um, agrees with your plants. Uh, so look where your sun path is. Where does the sun path travel? Is it too much sun in your area, like California? Because full sun in some areas of California is too much sun. You need partial sun or to create shade in certain parts of California because it's way too hot. Same with Arizona and New Mexico. Um, so you need to get enough solar energy. Um, if it's wind that you're facing, uh, you need to um, put up wind breaks. Um, some people need to plant um, like next to a house uh, to get shelter. Um, th th there's all these different considerations on where to plant. Uh, it's really kind of uh, individual uh, too because you could might be on someone else's property and might have m much choice. Um, we always we can't always do what's ideal uh, with our gardens, and that's why it's so cool though because so many of us have dealt with sub substandard situations where we're gardening where we can't have the full lawn or something we get this corner um, and we invent something new and that's why there's so many gardening techniques got cacti y'all got to uh, we've had cacti at the store yeah and looks like we have it online oh sweet so I got back up I got back up all right so someone else is jumping in and answering questions I've missed awesome keep throwing them at me uh, as you discuss location, I will cite uh, I will cite garden in Sierra. Okay, yeah. So my garden in the in the Sierra Nevadas uh, was in the foothills at 2,000 feet. It was outside Fresno, between Fresno, uh, California, and Yosemite National Park. So it was like right here, uh, and it's a uh, it was in coarse gold right near o Oakhurst. And my garden was like on a hill, and it was like a dial, like a sundial. And so in the morning sun hit, it was really hot and burned things really really bad and so I had to kind of grow in the shaded areas so that's why I say I hesitate to be like for everyone you know what I mean because I'm gonna be wrong if I say for everyone you do this with how you position your garden um, hope that helps uh, all right any other questions oh here we go do you have any mild microgreens okay so the thing with microgreens is they want, when people order microgreens, they want tons of seed for a low price because they're just gonna be growing it and cutting it and not saving it for seed. I totally get it. Um, mild microgreens um, could qualify as a bunch of different things. Uh, microgreens are just simply sprouts that we let go a little bit until they're almost starts and then we cut them. Um, so they could be like a bunch of different things in our catalog and there are a few options, bulk options, that this would like qualify for that you could do like a little microgreen thing with. Um, all the, uh, the Asian greens that we have, you know, like the dragon mix that we've traditionally had, um, we might still have it, but the Asian dragon mix, um, it's one of my favorite mixes, and it's all these different brassicas. There's like Mizuna, there's... Um, there's all these different mustard types, there's these purple types, there's these, these beautiful green types, and um, all those can be eaten early. Uh, the, all the kales can be eaten early. Um, a lot of lettuces, you just eat them early, they're called microgreens. So, uh, mild microgreens, I would look at looking at the kales, not the mustards, but the kales and the salads. Um, hope that helps you. All right. Uh, could Lufa grow in zone five if started early indoors? Uh, yeah, it's a vine. It's a, it's just like a gourd. It's going to be uh, prolific and just go, ah, and go crazy. So I don't see why it couldn't. And you know what you could do is you could have it grow out a window or something in a greenhouse. Um, and that way you could keep it during the, the whole year round. Um, by the way, I got a full cut in the mail. Awesome. I'm glad you like it. Asian dragon. Well, there was this dragon, there was this dragon greens mix uh, that I got a few years ago from Rare Seeds, or from Baker Creek um, uh, Heirloom Seeds. Um, and it, it's, all, it's from Jarrah's Travel uh, in, in Asia, and it's just a bunch of uh, brassicas, a bunch of uh, Asian greens, and they're awesome. Totally awesome. Um, and it's a mix, it's called the dragon mix. Uh, and there's the longer name, I just can't remember. Uh, do you happen to know of a good Tabasco to grow for rolling cigars? We have Tabasco peppers. Is that what you're getting at? 
I don't know about rolling cigars. I don't, I don't think I've ever rolled a cigar. <laughs> um, I, I've heard about people like rolling cigars to make them, but is it like a surprise? Like you roll the Tabasco pepper into it? Seems awful surprise. Okay, do you guys sell black tea seeds? Um, the commercial black tea. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think so. But we can ask, and, and I'll I'll look into that. Um, have you checked out Tulsi? Because it's amazing. Um, okay, uh, I have taken over a forty-year-old garden bed. However, it was overgrown with weeds, including thistles. Hmm. Trying to fix phosphorus. That's what thistles do. I have chopped down the weeds and put cardboard and dead leaves on top. That's really good. Is there anything else you would do? Yeah, okay, so you covered it with cardboard. That's great. Now, I would put compost like that, that thick on top of it. And then I would cover that compost with scatter mulch and then um, seeds. So um, as soon as those seeds uh, are going to start germinating, um, they can, they'll be there in place to compete with anything that comes up. So that's what I would do. Um, but yeah, chopping and dropping in place is the best way to handle weeds. Asking about Tabascos as in uh, tobaccos. Oh, did I misread that or did it misspell it uh, for you? Because autocorrect is real. Um, tobaccos as in smoking. Hmm. Tobacco is an excellent insectary plant. It attracts like bugs and then they like stick to it. So um, yeah, I don't know if I could ask if we're gonna be carrying tobacco. Um, that's interesting. Um, I will ask, or, or someone who is helping me out will answer you. Should I wait till spring for compost? It depends on how cold. If it gets really cold in your area, your compost heap is gonna have to really fight that cold to get up to heat to do the reactions. So you would have to make a giant pile. In summer, you can make your piles pretty small because the heat is, is ambient, so it can help you keep the reactions going. But when it's fighting against the heat, it, it'll, it'll slow down. So you could, you know, um, build your pile and then start and see how, how it goes and then just leave it in place uh, and, then, and then compost that pile by turning it, you know, keeping it 131 to 140 Fahrenheit for 15 days to kill the weed seeds, the pathogens, um, the parasitic eggs, and make it so that you have sterile compost, right? Because you got to do that. Okay, how do I find out what zone I'm in and what will grow? I'm in North Central Florida. Okay, so um, <laughs> so uh, there's zone maps. There's the USDA zone maps. Um, uh, those zones are shifting a little bit, and then we all fall into a microclimate. Everyone kind of falls into a microclimate. So it says we're the zone, but we're also a little bit left or right of the zone, you know what I mean? So uh, I would use the map just to Google it uh, online and look for your map and uh, see, find yourself and see what your zone is. But keep in mind that you can push it uh, up and down a bit uh, out of your zone. I meant should I wait until spring to put the compost you suggest in my 40 year old bed? Um, if you already got the uh, compost, um, I would just put it in so the compost works on the cardboard. Because uh, otherwise the cardboard might not break down. But keep in mind, I'm also from a drier area, so the cardboard in my area might not break down as fast as yours. Oh, shoot, I lost that question. I'm sorry, someone wrote a big question and I missed it. Uh, Brian Powers. Oh, another Powers! 9A8B. Pretty awesome. I was an 8B. Brian. Looks like all the powers love the 8B. Yeah, so that's your zone. Um, yeah, 8B is a good zone. You can grow a lot in 8B. So, all right, so, all right, all right. We're, we're so welcome. We're, we're, so, uh, we're so happy to help. You're so welcome. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a lot of fun. What's the best stuff to put in compost? All right, okay, so it depends. So if you do more woody compost, you make it more fungal dominant because you, fungi break down complex carbohydrates like wood. If you do more greens and fresh material, that's gonna be more bacterial dominant, which is actually more like annuals and the woody stuff's more fungal dominant, is more like perennials. That should really help you start on the journey there. Um, are there any benefits to a hugel culture growing bed compared to traditional raised garden bed? 
Uh, Hugo cultures are good for getting rid of uh, excess wood. They're a really great way to deal with wood. I don't encourage anyone to cut down trees of any sort to make Hugo beds. Um, it, it, yeah. Oh yeah, always balance the compost or it will stink. You need to do um, you need to do a third brown, a third green, and then a third like uh, nitrogen uh, based. So what that is is nitrogen form usually takes uh, the form of manures, right? Um, sometimes people can use um, different things like um, like comfrey as a starter and legumes. Um, but the greens, when they say greens, they mean fresh plants that have not gone to seed. People think that, that it's just dried and fresh. It's, it's fresh plants that have not gone to seed. So the nitrogen and the enzymes and all the good stuff and the sugars are still in the plant. Okay. Now the browns are all dry and it's gone to seed. So it's just like standing carbon and all the nitrogen, enzymes, and sugars and stuff went into that tiny seed and that's where they are. Um, so, so that's why, um, so, so that's, and then we combine those three, those three ingredients uh, and what happens is we get this um, thermophilic reaction, heat loving, thermophilic, philia, love, right? Thermophilic reaction, this heat reaction that uh, starts breaking down all that organic matter. And what really is going on, and I talked about this yesterday, is the soil life is consuming the organic matter and consuming each other and consuming the waste from each other and then consuming like, the dead forms and, you know, of each other and the residues of all these reactions. And so it's this, this huge reaction and what's going on is it, it constantly breaking down into these long carbon chains, which um, are what compost is, what humus is, um, and what uh, all the plants, you know, source and, and the fungi sources um, in, in the soil. So it's really, really important, really awesome. Composting is the key to, uh, to gardening and growing food the way nature has developed soil and grown plants for billions of years. So anything else, fertilizer wise, is just skipping, like the actual work. Um, so it's really imperative that we, we get into that. <laughs> uh, from Michigan, I am starting a raised bed garden. I can't read the rest of that, I'm so sorry. Do you happen to know of a good tobacco to grow? And I can't read the rest of that, and it's pinned. Um, well, I, I have tobacco seed and I've had, I've been given different tobacco seeds, um, for insectary plants. Um, I have like, I have Hopi and then I have this, um, uh, I can't remember the other one. Um, but yeah, I would always go with Native American seeds first when I start a garden. You know why? Because they were here, they were growing it, and they were doing it uh, without any inputs, usually. Uh, I mean, they might bring in like fish or something like that, you know, we, we've heard about in the stories, but um, yeah, go with, go with Native American seeds. And our, our company has tons of Native American seeds to choose from. And, uh, and I have heard that there's a resurgence in uh, care for Native American seeds and saving of American uh, Native American seeds. Uh, and I, I know personally people are working on this uh, and I've also read about it through many other sources online and it's really exciting because in a lot of ways these are the best seeds um, for the areas that we live in in America because they were here first. Their genetics is paired to this landscape for, for, for you know, hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. So it's pretty incredible. Uh, when we work with that. So Ashley Watson, I would check out like Hopi tobacco or any tobacco that was Native American lines. Hope that helps. I found a source for horse manure. Okay, so the thing with uh, manure that you wanna be careful about is making sure that they haven't put any like um, deworming uh, stuff in the animal's feed because the, if, if it's that dewormer stuff in it, it's gonna kill 
the, the naturally occurring positive beneficial worms in the soil. Um, so that, that's an issue. I need Thai red roselle. Can I, yeah, you need Thai red roselle. Everybody needs Thai red roselle. And you know what? The Jamaican and the Thai are both good. Uh, one's just like more upright and the other's more bushy. And the calyxes are different sizes. But you don't eat the calyxes, you're boiling them to make the tea. So both are good. Um, but yeah, Thai red roselle is awesome. Yeah, I love it. Okay. So, um, any other questions? The pinned one, I don't know. I, I think I answered that. I think we can unpin that because it's blocking my ability to read all the other questions that come passing through. If we could do that, that'd be great. Um, so, have you got any suggestions on ornamental cut Ely? I can't read the rest of that word. Elements, ornamental cut and elements. Um, hmm. So typically for me, just to put it out there, I grow food typically. I rarely grow, um, and I grow plants that support the soil, uh, the, the, you know, the soil food web, the, the, um, the bugs, the insects, uh, the pollinators. I don't grow anything ornamental, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I like the way flowers look. I like flowers that can grow food, too, and then I can eat them. Uh, some, some amazing edible flowers that are also beautiful are calendula. You can make a, a um, wonderful uh, lotion with calendula as well. You can, uh, you can infuse oil with calendula and use it on cuts and stuff like that. People do that. Um, I really like uh, uh, bachelor buttons. You can eat those too and they're these little like sprays of color. They're like bluish, periwinkle blue. Um, I like, oh, all right, so my favorite edible flower, oh, it's actually a debate. It's my favorite edible flower is, um, is arugula flowers. And then uh, my other favorite is, um, it's a ground cover and it tastes like uh, pepper. Oh man, ah, I could just, I could see it at home. Uh, well, I'll remember it later and I'll post it. Uh, so someone asked, uh, Vetch. I love working with Vetch. I don't know about Crown Vetch. I worked with Harry Vetch. And that's a wonderful winter legume to use. I highly recommend it. Any food I can plant outdoors in West Central Florida? You totally can plant food outdoors in winter in West Central Florida. I mean, you guys are warmer than 8B. Um, I, I, nasturtium, that's the one. I love nasturtium. So, Everyone should taste nasturtium in salad or just in your garden. It's a wonderful thing to do. And it's also great to play with kids. Um, so do you have a suggestion for unusual pepper to grow? Uh, it depends. Uh, we have a lot of unusual hot peppers. Uh, we have some, uh, funny, uh, some, some funny looking ones. Someone asked about uh, Hugel culture again. Um, I'll just remember that. Um, but, but yeah, we've got, we got the, I like the scorpion, the scorpion tailed ones, not the Trinidad because it scares me because it's so hot, but there's a bunch of ones with the pointy end like that. That's, that's pretty cool. I really, you know, to be honest, I really like the Italian, um, I really like the Italian, um, the Italian, uh, frying peppers. That, that's my favorite. Uh, there's, I mean, there's so many to choose from. I really like the orange, uh, the orange colored ones, purple colored ones. Uh, I like ones you don't see in the stores. <laughs> all right, well, I think I'm about to use up all the space in my phone. So thank you so much for hanging out today. And uh, I'm glad I was able to answer some of your questions. Uh, they have the fish peppers. Check them out. They're awesome. Uh, and that's a great option, too. I like the way that mottled stripes are on it. All right, have a wonderful day. Bye.